So thank, thanks to the organizers for giving me a chance to speak here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my sort of journey with GA and computing uh, and sort of lessons I've learned along the way and, and hopefully one or two little tips that might be useful for other people. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about Julia, which is kind of, I think the end of my journey. I, I think I finally found a language that I don't see myself moving away from. I'm going to talk a little bit about hardware, but actually very, very little about hardware. To the, the answer to that, it's very simple. Um, so a little, little bit about me. I've, I've started working in GMH Algebra around 1990. Um, wrote a number of papers in the book with Anthony. Uh, then I kind of stepped out from academia for a number of years, uh, formed a company called GMRX that did graphics for video games. So an image from a Japanese game there that used our tech. Um, we ended up being acquired by ARM, so I spent four years at ARM. Um, part of the reason I spent so long there was I was actually thinking about trying to persuade ARM to put some GA into hardware, um, but never really came to anything. Uh, now I'm, I'm doing some research and I'm looking after a couple of companies that are possibly of interest. Uh, the top one there, Monumo, is a new startup that is using AI to design more efficient electric motors and as part of that, they need very, very fast electromagnetic simulations. And we are using some GA to get some fast, fast simulations running. Uh, and the second company called Fovotech that is looking at replacing projective geometry in the graphics pipeline with a way of viewing 3D worlds that is more natural uh, and that allows you to see with a much wider field of view without distortions. And it's um, getting lots of interest from companies like NVIDIA and AMD and Intel. Uh, and I do manage to do a little bit of research now. So my interest currently, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, GMESH Gadger in AI. Um, every time I come to one of these conferences, every sort of 10 years, I bang on about discrete geometric calculus and we need to pay attention to this field. You know, Nordink, he's heard me before on this. <laughs> uh, and uh, my kind of hobbyist stuff is still gate theory gravity. That's uh, uh, it's fascinating. Um, so a, a number of years ago, I got, I always struggled with object-oriented programming and never really got happy with C++ and I decided that functional programming was, was more my thing. And I dived, I dived into Haskell, which is this sort of the purest functional programming language. Uh, and my usual thing when I want to learn a new language is I implement geometric algebra in it just to sort of learn the, the language semantics. And like, uh, it's a kind of fascinating language. Um, the default data structure is a linked list. So you can store things as lists of tuples and that gives you kind of fairly natural multi-vector structure where every blade is the value and an integer representing the blade. And then your multi-vector is just a list of these things. A really, really nice semantics to work with. Um, and I started off using a, a trick that I think Steve Gold first showed me uh, ages ago where you represent the blade with uh, basically a, a, a bit string. And for generality, it's quite useful to just work with the balanced algebra, the one that David likes to call the, the mother algebra, though I think we're less keen on gender terms like that these days, so I prefer balanced algebra, uh, where you have equal numbers of vectors in squared plus one or minus one. Uh, so here, for example, the... Uh, the blade E1, E2, F2, E4 would just be encoded with the binary number above. So you would just be sort of basically it's just 77. The beautiful thing with this representation is that multiplication of two blades is just a binary XOR operation. So in theory should be blisteringly fast. Unfortunately, Haskell did not actually have access to basic binary operations. So it was not blisteringly fast, it was incredibly slow because you had to actually do this by hand in the code. Um, the tricky part though, is you can get the right blade, but you still want to do the sign calculation because the sign calculation is critical. And to do the sign calculation, you have to first of all count the number of swaps. So if we're doing a product like the one shown there, first of all, the E1's got to go past three things until it hits the final E1 on the left. Then the F2's got to go through and you've also got to count the fact it's negative one. So fairly, fairly simple kind of calculation to set up, um, but not something that these is easy to do in a very, very fast way. Counting the number of negative squares is easy because it's just a kind of bit mask. You, you can do that through that file. But counting the swaps is, is tricky. And in particularly in Haskell, it was awkward because I had to do 
by hand extract all of the binary representations and then count the things. And um, what kind of interested me for a while though is that this counting of swaps operation is really, really easy to implement in, in hardware. You can, you can write the, um, uh, you can easily just spec out a piece of circuitry that would just do it uh, and it would take no time at all, very little energy as well. Um, and that was kind of why I was interested in promoting this inside R before I realized it's probably, this is just probably not the right way to do geometric algebra anyway for, for performance. Uh, but there, and then of course there was this additional problem that, you know, inside Haskell there was no operation, no sort of access to these core binary things. But the end, the end implementation is really, really simple. You end up with a single blade product, which basically takes the integer bits, figures out the sign, and then multiplies the values together. And then you extend that by just saying that the, when you're multiplying together two lists of blades, two multivectors, just take X and Y from the list, multiply them together, and add, the, add them all up. Um, works absolutely fine. Uh, the code is very, very clean, uh, but it was really slow, very slow. There were a lot, there are very, various issues with Haskell um, and there are issues with this approach. The first one is linked lists are just a terrible data structure for performance because you're just pointer chasing all along. Um, you can't kind of broadcast operations over linked lists because you, you don't have this kind of have arrays underneath it that you can broadcast over. And then there's this more concrete problem that you have to do n times n multiplications for each product. And then you get this huge mess of things and you've got to sort them uh, and simplify down to get the final answer. None of this is particularly fast or, or, or hardware friendly. Uh, so this all works and it gave me something kind of useful, but it's not really something you want to use in a production environment. I don't actually know how to get, right, up the bottom line of the screen is missing. No, I'm going to make that disappear. Um, but one thing I did start, did realize in it, as I started to migrate to other languages to get, get better speed, is there is a better way of doing this binary representation, which I was quite pleased to figure out. Um, so I started moving to Julia. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is re-implement the Haskell code in Julia, where I can now actually have access to some binary operations. And, but I wanted to get rid of this counting of swaps thing. And, and the trick here is to use these matrix isomorphisms. So the, these should be fairly familiar. David's talked about them in the past. They're very, very rich. The top one we kind of recognize as the conformal split concept. Um, and because we're doing, just looking at this balanced algebra implementation, we can recursively use the top one. And the point there is that it breaks products down into things that commute. So we don't have to worry about counting how they slide past each other. So we, with that kind of decomposition, what you do is you decompose your balanced algebra and then into this tensor product of the base one. So one E1, F1 and N1 where N1 is just E1, F1. And then that's multiplied by the next thing, but the next thing does not have vectors as a generator. It's got tri vectors because you need the factors of n one in there, so that everything in the second set commutes with everything in the first set, and then you go on building things up like that. Um, so when you work with this as your kind of basis element, you have this advantage that everything now commutes, so you can just work out all the little computations uh, separately. And we don't have to do this kind of vector cascade and count things. And actually, I, I suspect there's kind of a little bit more to this. Um, I think maybe Gareth Sobbs is going to talk about this as well. This feels like there's kind of more, more to come from this type of decomposition. Now, it does make the representation slightly more complicated because the binary uh, code isn't just representing vectors now. It's representing these, in, these different objects that all commute with each other. But it's not a big deal. I'm sorry, again, the bottom just disappeared off, but that, that's showing, for example, that the vector F3 is no longer represented as a single binary thing. It's got eight extra bits in it. But we still have a nice bitwise representation of every, every blade in the algebra. Uh, the product is still a binary XOR, so it's extremely fast. And the sign calculation just gives composing to get into sign right for each of these two by two blocks. So all we need to do is look at the multiplication table for G11, which got there, and just look at the bits where we get a minus sign. 
and you kind of stare at this table for a bit and you realize that can you tell whether they're seeing this properly on the zoom they'll see okay he's Is it possible to get all of the ah uh, no it's on full screen yeah uh, no I think the only problem is that oh well no the the problem is that zoom menu bar doesn't want to go away and that's oh they didn't see it oh okay no, so, so it's fine okay it, apparently it's, it's, it seems to be fine yeah okay it's, so it's just a side problem here no problem right uh Oh, he's done this stupid thing where I, I can't go backwards and forwards now. Uh, oh, click back on it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, you should be good. You should be okay. Though. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think is that all okay? Yeah. So send a message if it's not working, but hopefully that's all fine now. Uh, so. Um, where was I? So yes, you stay at this table and you see you look for what rules we need to see that to pick out when those minus signs are going to occur. And the answer is if the first vector in the product contains an F and the second one is a vector, then put in a minus sign. And all we need to do is just compute that for our, our two, uh, two blades trying to multiply together. And this we can do with binary operations again. Um, so obviously checking that the first one contains an F is just an AND with that number as a representative binary. And the second one, this is the, the sort of the neat trick. We want to check if the second term is a vector. So the way we do that is we start with the binary representation of the second term, and then we shift it left by one bit and look at the, uh, the second slot, the fourth slot, and so on. Uh, do an XOR between them. And if there's one in that slot, then the thing was a vector. And again, that binary shift left is a primitive operation in, in most kind of modern programming languages. So all you then have to do is uh, a shift left, an XOR, an AND, all bitwise operations, and then just count the number of uh, ones left in the result. And that tells you the sign. So this is all managed to get that implemented in, in Julia. It's all working nicely. And that gave at least a factor of 10 improvement over Haskell, actually probably way, way more than that. Um, before I talk a little bit more detail about you, I just want to say a little kind of honorable mention to, to processing, which is another language that I've played around with quite a lot. Any kind of processing users in the audience? <laughs> uh, it's, it's worth, if you want to do some rapid prototype, prototyping 3D geometry with, with access to most things, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and you can write reasonable GA code in it. But it is Java based, so it's kind of object oriented and you can't overload the multiplication operator, so your code's pretty ugly. But it, it, it works, it does support the binary operation, so it seems to run pretty fast. And there's a decent ecosystem for it. Um, if you're kind of stuck and want to do a very, very quick 3D prototype, then Julia uh, processing is actually quite a good, good option. Anyway, um, the main uh, I think I want to talk about was Julia. So are there any Julia users in the audience? Uh, a few, okay, a couple of wavy hands. <laughs> um, so I, I, I've now, uh, ah, a couple online, right. Julia, I think is, is, is a, it's a wonderful, it's a fairly new language. It, it For me, it's perfect. And I, I suspect for a lot of people that are used to kind of thinking in a more mathematical way about geometric algebra, it, it should be a very, very natural choice. The goal is it should run as fast as C, 
but it's high level language. The idea is you kind of code a bit like MATLAB, but underneath you get performance that is C-like. It also has this great advantage that you can write once in Julia, and then the compiler can push your code to the CPU, but it can also compile for CUDA. So you can get GPU acceleration without, often without having to change a line of code. Um, obviously it's modern language, so the memory is managed for you. It's, it's, it's got a good garbage collector. Um, and it has this clever thing called multiple dispatch. So it's a little bit like an operator overloading, overloading, but slightly sort of neater. And it has a world-class uh, ID going with it. So it's, it's the default sort of set now is to use Microsoft's VS code, which is free for everyone. Really nice setup, all free, very, very fast compilers. Uh, and it's, it's growing, people are kind of tracking the growth of Julia and it is ahead of where Python was at these same points in its trajectory. So it's on a very strong growth path. I do expect it that things like the high performance computing community will all move to Julia uh, over the next sort of decade or so. Uh, and a quick warning is every language has their quirks. Julia's quirk is the raise industry start at one. So having spent 30 years uh, fighting bugs because I started my raise at one when I shouldn't have done, I now find that half the time in Julia, I forget that they don't start at zero anymore. But one is where they should start, as any, as any physicist would tell you. Um, so well, what I wanted to do was to implement a very fast uh, implementation of GA in Julia. And first thing I did was follow the Haskell style thing of having uh, you know, arrays of values and their blade. Uh, and you just make a little switch and instead of doing arrays of structs, you have a struct with two arrays in them, which gives you some performance improvement. Implemented it all, uh, got a nice sort of pretty fast implementation of 4.4, four, so that everything else is kind of a sub-algebra of that. And it was, that's actually good enough for most practical purposes, but I was kind of put off because if I, if I just took two quaternions from that and multiplied them together, it was taking about 5,000 nanoseconds for a calculation versus 300 for a four by four matrix multiply. So it was clearly not that efficient. And then I sat down and just said, well, I wonder how, what just a handwritten quaternion multiply would look like inside Julia. And that takes 10 seconds, not 10 nanoseconds, incredibly fast. So that's basically was the sort of warning sign that actually, if you wanted this stuff to run really, really fast, we should be going back to the basic for the small address, the basic matrix representations of over reals, complexes, quaternions, and just optimize, make that run as fast as possible. Uh, so this is the table of matrix representations, and we're going to implement some of the, the lower ones up to about six. Uh, and I was going to make use of some of these identities, particularly the even subalgebra rule. Uh, so, of course, what I could do is just implement this. So I could say for say G20, I could just implement that as two by two matrices over the reals. Um, but that is actually very wasteful. Um, the, the thing is in any normal application where you're using geometric algebra, we never add even and odd elements in the same expression. We always work with things that are purely even or purely odd and multiply them together. So rather than representing the full algebra, you can get a big speed up just by representing the even subalgebra and having a map between even and odd elements. And the precise form of that map does depend on the algebra you're in. The one counter example would be EMB fields in 3D, but actually you don't want to be adding EMB fields in 3D because you want to be in space-time algebra and that's the correct place to add them. So instead of just implementing the algebra in the kind of brain dead way, we are going to form the metric representation, the even subalgebra, define a canonical map between odd and even, and then implement four products, plus, 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 minus, except for even, 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 odd, odd, even, odd, odd. So it's a little bit more work code-wise, but, but generally um, not, not that difficult. And the kind of philosophy I always have with writing GAs, I don't want to write some big bloated software with loads and loads of different products in you just implement the geometric products, the only thing you need. So we need a geometric product, we need a projection operation that takes an object and picks out elements of a particular grade. 
we need something that picks out the scalar part. And there's two versions of that. One that picks out the scalar part of a multi-vector and one that takes out the scalar part of a product because there's a little optimization we can do there. And we need a reverse operation. And that's it. Those basically those are the only things that we implement. A couple of, couple of caveats around that. Um, so the simplest example is G20, just 2D Euclidean algebra. The map from odd to even is the one that you're probably familiar with, David's map from vectors to complex numbers. The even subalgebra are just complex numbers. So this is very, very easy. And you can sort of see the little trick you have to do when you're doing an odd odd multiply is you take the complex conjugate of the first one. Okay. Uh, and if we kind of look at that inside uh, via, inside VS code, so this is not going to be the easiest thing in the world to read. It's going to be, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be very hard. Um, I'll just show you a little bit of what is going on with the codes here. Um, all of the code consists of a core, which is the basic sort of functionality. So a structure tells you how you're representing even and odd things. They are both the same, but by having two structs, one for even, one for odd, you keep track of what objects uh, you're working with. Uh, and then you just define a bunch of multiplication, addition, subtraction formula. And the way it works inside Julia is you just, you just define the, the multiply operator for the example of say two even multivectors, two odd multivectors. I will give that a go. Uh, oh, that did actually make it a bit bigger, didn't it? Let me try that again. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so you you define instances of addition, subtraction, etc., and then Julia's multiple dispatch take just adds this instance of say star of multiply to its list of all the instances of multiply, and then you just can use it normally. So. Here, for example, if I include that particular algebra, so that one is GA20. Uh, and now I can do, say, E1 times E1, you get one. E1 times E2, yeah, I2. Nothing particularly magic here. Uh, and the, the actual work is these instances here of multiply. So you can see we've got multiply between uh, two even, which just takes the complex product, multiply uh, between an even and an odd, where you have to say conjugate the first one, for instance, like that. Um, and then there's some wrapper code that defines a few basis vectors uh, up here, like that, so defines globals, and uh, a little bit of pretty typing stuff down here. Uh, the other thing you have to give in examples of how to do the projection operations. So how do you pick out the uh, uh, projection operation applied to even elements and to odd elements to pick out the scalar part, vector part, and so on. And that's, again, sort of specific to each example. So that, that particular case is obviously trivial to do. Uh, let me just uh, run up another example. Um, but just working on to the other cases. Let's uh, just run through them. So GA30, for example, this is the one that works sort of most familiar ones. The even subalgebra is just a quaternion algebra. So all we need is a fast quaternion implementation. In that particular case, um, GA30. Uh, I have got a mini kind of quaternion library, but actually this is just implemented by hand. So you define a, every element here is just a, a quaternion, just defines a struct. And a little bit further down here, when you come to define the product, you just by hand expand out the uh, geometric product, the quaternion product like that. And the, the Julia compiler does a very good job of just op optimizing that for SIMD. Um, and in odd dimensional spaces, the map between even subalgebra and odd subalgebra is trivial. You just multiply by the pseudo scalar. Um, it's, there's no reason to do anything else there. Uh, and that means you just got to keep, for odd odd, you just got to keep track of the sign. So the sign is completely different there. Uh, a little bit of work defining the reverse operation and then the 
projection operations, uh, but all very, very easy. And if you, uh, if you then sort of write something like psi psi reverse to do a rotation in there, it takes about 60 nanoseconds, uh, way faster than a four by four matrix multiply. And you're kind of down the point where it's hard to do much better than that. Um, so this is you know, extremely fast. Um, obviously, as a, as a physicist, I then went and implemented the space-time algebra. Again, even subalgebra in this case is two by two complex matrices. The, the way to do this has been set by David long, long time ago. Uh, so the representation by the Pali matrices, uh, but actually, again, rather than implementing two by two complex matrices, uh, I did this all by hand because that just gives you a little bit more performance. So STA core, you just look at the basic representation here. You just work with a, a set of four complex numbers and then the sort of the two by two matrix algebra is just sort of fed in by hand here. Turns out to be a little bit faster that way. Um, oh, there, there, and there is, uh, I probably won't show it because it's not too much. Time. A nice feature of Julia is it supports Unicode, so you can actually have your gammas and sigmas appearing directly in your code, which is quite, quite nice. Um, at this point, I, I, somebody I was talking about this said, well, isn't that just Bayless's power vectors back again? And wasn't I supposed to be? opposed to, to that approach that it's kind of the wrong way to do uh, the wrong way to do space time algebra and the answer is uh, no that's actually the fact that it works in well in code shows exactly why I think Bayless was Bayless's thing was kind of wrong because as humans we don't think in code we think in terms of vectors and by vectors and so on so we will be working uh, with the full STA um, but we, it turns out if you then want to do a very, very fast implementation of that, it makes sense to work with two by two complex matrices. But we'd never do them in our own calculation. We're never going to write out Pali matrices and, and multiply the matrices together. Um, but it runs very, very fast code wise. Um, this G4, G40 is another sort of interesting one. This is what, how you do classical projective geometry. So old fashioned projective geometry, not, not the, the weird new thing. Um, this is, uh, it doesn't get utilized much, but this is actually surprisingly powerful because the even subalgebra is just a pair of quaternions. Because in Euclidean four dimensional space, the pseudoscalar squares to plus one, and you can break your even subalgebra into half one plus e and a half one minus e. All you then have to do is implement a pair of quaternion products. So we, just, we can look at a little bit at the code for that one. Uh, look at say the core representation here this is a pair of quaternions we're both even and the odd and the various multiply operations are pretty easy down here as well they're just various quaternion products uh, so all very, kind of very simple and then the the thing that kind of gets exposed the, the bit you you load up just has some basis elements encoded that um, and the fact that it's just two quaternion products is, is extremely fast this is way faster than doing four by four matrix multipliers for example um, and of course that type of old style projective geometry is still what underlies open gl and kind of most of the graphics pipeline so it's probably worth spending a little time playing around with that particularly if you're interested in actual classical projective geometry uh, and obviously have to implement the PGA as well, as, as Leo explained, it's the rather unfortunately named PGA because it's got nothing to do with projective geometry, really. It's got homogeneous coordinates in there. It should have been named EGA after Euclidean geometry. I kind of joke that the, the P is silent. So when we, we write it as PGA, but it's pronounced EGA. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that one, for example, again, a pair of quaternions are all you need to, uh, uh, oh, and I can't see all my other ones, so I have to delete a few from across. Uh, you just need a pair of quaternions uh, as your basis vector, as your basis for the even subalgebra. 
And then the product is a little bit more clunky. I think it's actually explained there. You have three quaternion products and an ad, but it's not exactly difficult to implement. Uh, and again, blisteringly fast. Uh, so if we include, say, PGA. Uh, we have basic elements, E1, E2, E3. And I've used a convention that Leo likes to use. So E0 is the null one. So I assume I haven't messed up. E0 times E0 should be zero. Okay. Um, and one other thing, because it's PGA, uh, we need this slightly weird dual operation. Uh, so there's an extra function here called dual, which does the, does the sort of map thing that we use in uh, in PGA, so the dual of E0, for example, is I3 and so on. And again, I, I'm pretty sure I've got the conventions right, so they agree with the Stephen Leo um, style. Uh, and again, the, the underneath the hood here, these are just some quaternion multipliers. So this again is, you're talking sort of nanoseconds for the basic operations. Um, and I've used this in, uh, in doing sort of camera flyby stuff, e ED is very fast. Um, other ones I've implemented so far, uh, CGA. Uh, so again, fairly easy to do. And, and one of, again, I use a lot. Um, in this case, the underlying representation, even so bad, is two by two matrices over quaternions. So again, for speed, it's not implemented as Two by two matrices, it's just a, a struct containing four quaternions with some hand coding of the precise multiply operations. Uh, and the biggest one I got to is up to three, three. So the balanced algebra three, three. Even subalgebra is a pair of four by four matrices. These uh, are implemented using a static array package, which gives you slightly better performance than the lean algebra package. And again, this, this is still way down in a nanosecond for, for base for compute here. So this gives you an, a nice kind of rock solid, very, very performant base that you can build much more complicated things on. Um, so, so just to wrap up, first thing I said I'd talk about was hardware. So I, I spent a long time thinking about really fancy ways of implementing geometric algebra and hardware, but actually I've kind of changed my mind now. It, 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 any, anyone who, from a hardware background who asked me what could, we, what could be done to speed up geometric algebra implementations. Well, if we look at the ones that get used a lot, 3D Euclidean, 4D Euclidean for projective geometry, PGA and CGA, they are all algebras over the quaternions. All we need is a absolutely optimal quaternion implementation in hardware. And we can, we'll do all the rest, right? We know how to handle what to do with these quaternions. Um, but that, that's, that is kind of the end of the hardware story, I think. Just give us quaternions as fast as possible. And we're not the only people asking this. A lot of people in the games community have been asking for hardware op optimized quaternion multipliers as well, because they use them in their engines, they use them for animation and so on. Uh, and I think the, the hardware guys are pretty receptive to this, just need to keep pushing them to get quaternion multiply as a primitive operation. So, just to sum up, um, personally, I, I, I really welcome this, this, this trend now we're seeing away from object oriented towards functional programming. I think it's one that works for people like, like us who are used to thinking in terms of functions operations. We're not, most of us aren't software engineers. Uh, Haskell, slow, yeah, don't bother with it. Um, but Julia does give us this incredibly fast and is very, very rich uh, system of things to work in. Um, the implementation is boiled down to some very, very simple stuff. Uh, just these four product operations, projection onto grade and so on. And the interface is, is very clean. Um, all this code is available. Can you just, yeah, can you just give me the, the screen back? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you want to play around with this library, it's, it is all publicly available on GitHub. Um, it isn't quite finished. Uh, and actually that was the main thing I wanted to talk about was there are a few questions left to sort out before it gets released formally. It's 
released, but you can, you know, you can play around with it if it's not finished. Uh, and I was hoping that maybe there'd be one or two people here or online who can help me with sort of sorting out the last few questions. So the question I have is, what's the best way to structure this as a package? Because when you release stuff in Julia, you tend to release as a package and you need, we, we need some way of figuring out which particular metric you're using, you need a way to, to, uh, to sort of get that working. Um, you notice a couple of times when I was running there, you have to kind of exit and then reload it if you work with globals. Uh, and that, I, I don't think that's quite efficient because the suspecting code, you might want to be having part of your code in 2D, part in 3D, part in 4D. You need to be able to work with all these things simultaneously. Um, if anyone can think of further optimization tricks that might still be, be valid to squeeze a little bit more performance out, I'd be certainly be interested to hear, particularly in the quaternion bit, if, there is, if there's any extra way to get some performance out here. And, and are there any other kind of base level functionalities that people feel really strongly should be in a package like this? My, my philosophy was to try to just give the very, very small base level functionality, because I think the fun of GA is then building your own stuff on top of it. But if there's anything that people feel really has to be there in a base implementation, then I, I'd be interested to hear. And yeah, if you want to contact me or just download the code, uh, all the links are, are there. Um, best of all, email me on the Gmail one. The other one's kind of for more academic stuff. And you can follow me on Twitter if you like. I'm not a not regular user, but occasionally something pops up. Uh, and finally, can I say a big thank you to the organizers for accommodating me in their schedule at pretty short notice. So thank you. <clears throat> Uh, do, do, do you want, have you got some questions on there? Wonder. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, yep. Answer is absolutely yes to the X when log, and probably the related ones like science and cons and the uh, causes and the hyperbolic things. You use those, for example, for interpolating and going from one place to another place smoothly. They'll want to be there, even if they're part of some other. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of agree. Um, and I, I think it's a fairly simple thing to implement. And because underneath this, you've got some matrices of quaternion. So implementing exponential is not a big step. So I think that's one I, I will do. Um, not so sure about the log because it's a bit multi valued and you, you may want to make particular uh, things there. But particularly ones where. Yeah, underneath you just work with complex numbers. Julia already has a lot of the science and cause and exponents already built in, so it's a pretty small step. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, lots of questions. Nope. <laughs> so, Chris, what's the plotting packages like? Because you know, yeah, if you, we need to do it, but we need to see what we're doing. Yeah, so uh, for, for 2D. Julia has a really rich plotting ecosystem. Uh, it supports kind of Cairo, Mackey, all the, all the kind of standard things you'd use. And there, there are tons and tons of libraries. Uh, and we, it's heavily used in kind of uh, a lot of scientific computing, which has got all, all the kind of standard stuff you need. The, one slight weakness is I don't think Julia's quite there on 3D yet. Uh, it's, it's kind of solution for 3D is to provide some bindings to OpenGL and then you're back in OpenGL world, which is not ideal. But there's a lot of work going on to, to improve that. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I have someone looking at the chat for me. Uh, can you improve computer geometric simulation speed over? Oh, okay. Uh, what did you say? Yes, I presume so. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, multiplication by oh, yes, yeah. Concurrent multiplication is defined without matrix multiplication. It is actually, it's defined, it's expanded out by hand because that seems to give the best performance at the moment. Uh, can you briefly explain the diagram with the triangle of algebra? Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, I, no, I can't explain that briefly, uh, but it, it, there is the, the theory of the representations of geometric algebra, so representation of Clifford algebras, was worked out in the 40s and 50s, 
and it turns out that you only need to know the first eight. Uh, you need, only need to get algebras down to dimension eight because after that, the thing, the pattern repeats. It's something called a bot periodicity. That triangle is the geometric algebra of PQ, uh, where the thing across the top is P minus Q and P plus, plus Q is the same thing down the side. I hope that made some sense. Um, we also did some experiments with, with hardware and um, we came to the point that at the end we always need sums of products. So we came to, to another uh, point then you maybe we should uh, discuss that because the nice thing with uh, sums of products is many applications can use it while the product of quaternions not all the uh, not so many can, can solve. so i uh, maybe we, we should understand what what the difference of of our uh, solutions is yeah uh, yeah the, the the original implementation i had was sums of products so you multiply you store things as blades you multiply all the terms together add them up and simplify uh which, which is fine and if if performance isn't a killer for you it's perfectly acceptable um but i wanted to find something here that was just as fast as i could possibly make it uh and there the the problem with just working with just sort of blade representations particularly think for things like rotors is let, let's say we're in a four dimensional space you multiply together two even elements as eight components so 64 multiplies that's already inefficient because you could do that in matrices with 32 multiplies. And the reason is the existence of these idempotents. So you can decompose your eight objects into two chunks and they don't, some of them don't see each other. So you, you can make the other approach work, but to get speed, you have to hand code the idempotent structure. Going for the matrix representation gives you that straight away. But there is a, there is a tipping point though, because the matrices after about size dimension eight they start to get very very big and you don't want to be using motion you want to be working in the, the more general approach definitely yeah. uh is that it oh. uh, oh stephen's answered them all thank you stephen <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, not, uh, could your library build R? Ah, no, I, I, there's no, there's, there's no sense in which this is, this can give you an arbitrary algebra. You, you do have to make specific choices for each one, and you have to hand code the multiplication and the reverse and projection operations for each particular, particular algebra. So it is just a question of implementing the ones that you want. Um, what, what the library does have though is, is the the structure is all kind of templated so there are just bits you have to fill in every time you want to add a new new algebra to it actually that's probably something i should add is that template so that other people if they want to add in a new algebra can do that easily <laughs>